Today's episode of the BS Podcast brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor since 1981. Find the best tickets for Caps, Penguins, Celts, Bulls, Wiz Hawks, Rangers Round 2, any MLB game, Hamilton, maybe even Game 5, Clips, Jazz. Hurrah, Bob's thinking about it. You name it, I have SeatGeek on my phone. It's by far the easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to their revolutionary grading system. Buy and sell tickets. Just two taps on your phone, two taps, everything fully guaranteed. Try it out. Download the SeatGeek app today. Or go right to SeatGeek.com. We're also brought to you by The Watch. That's where you can find the ringers Chris Ryan and Andy Greenwald talking pop culture on Mondays and Thursdays. If you love The Leftovers, you definitely want to hear their latest pod with Leftovers creator Damon Lindelof. Subscribe to The Watch wherever you get podcasts. Check out the Ringer NFL show because it's Draft Week and Robert Mays, Mike Lombardi, Kevin Clark have you covered before, during, and after the draft. And finally, check out TheRinger.com. We were loaded today including a slew of NBA pieces. Kevin O'Connor did the Premature Playoff Awards. And Sean Fantasy found the courage to be the only writer on the Internet who doesn't love watching Russell Westbrook and thinks his play is counterproductive. And it is the most... We're going to talk about to Haralba about this in a second. The most polarizing topic dating back to 2011 when we had Grantland in six years. Westbrook is the most polarizing topic I can ever remember in the office. Yep. More polarizing than TV shows, movies... Anything. Anyway, uh, you will find at least one NBA piece for me on the ringer.com this week. Maybe two. Coming up, Horalabob Vulgaris, our old friend. Here comes Pearl Jam. Well, the people are asking for it. They're saying, where's Haral Bob? Where is he? He used to come on the podcast from for, for years. I, I want to know what to think about the MVP. I want to know I want to know who's gonna win the NBA playoffs. And and he, he was just he was MIA and now he's here. Haral Bob Bulgaris. One of here. our favorites. Yep. How good are you? Here. I'm good. Good. Um who did you have just out of curiosity for MVP? You had Kawhi, correct? Yeah, I had Kawhi. That's a tough one. I'm pretty happy with it, I think. I mean not that I have a vote, but if I did have a vote I'd at first, that, I usually don't really pay much attention to the MVP. I think it's kind of a first of all, what did I don't really understand? Careful, it. it's the highlight of my life voting for it every year. <laughs> I love voting for MVP. Yeah, usually I don't really pay much attention <laughs> because this year was so interesting. I thought there's so many different ways you could go with it, and there's so many different arguments. I mean, you could argue one to four. I don't think there's ever been an MVP where you could do one to three, let alone one to four. Yeah, I mean, you, you probably could make. There's an been argument. a couple, I, just not this century. Sure. There has been a four-person race like yeah, this since I've. Been following See, since you've been into it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I went Kawhi. I think people discount his defense. People discount how efficient he is on offense. Um, just having to, he's the only player who has to defend the other team's best option on offense, usually. Now, there's lots of arguments you could make against Kawhi, like he rests, doesn't play that many minutes, plays on a really good team. But yeah, I went Kawhi. You were on the Kawhi train. A couple years before it became Super cool. Early. Yeah, like 2013 you were into it. But you're, Even earlier. Your models and stuff, because you were, you were gambling on the NBA for years and years, your models always favored two-way players, right, a little bit? Yeah, I don't know if they favor two-way players. They just realize how important a two-way player is. Uh, Kawhi, definitely an example. But also just the efficiency and the ability to do different things in terms of where you're getting your points from, how I many times I mean, he doesn't turn the ball over very much. He doesn't really do anything bad on offense. Right. Like if Kawhi has a bad game offensively shooting, which he almost never does, he doesn't do anything else bad. So you you know it's not like Carmelo has a bad game on offense. It's just he's a complete zero because he's not probably not defending very well. He's probably not rebounding. He's probably not you know getting very many steals or anything like that. Kawhi does all that. Uh, another guy that we were probably pretty far ahead on was Paul George. I think is another example of that. Paul George was someone that I liked for a long time before he became really, really good. He's up. And now he's overrated. No, he's <laughs> he's definitely overrated. No way. I don't. I mean, I. It, you're like, oh, I'm he's not so. A fan. In, like he's, he's so inconsistent. Paul George is so inconsistent. It's like, oh, I mean, the year that he came back from breaking his leg in two. Yeah, that's true. I mean, <laughs> that is the one case for Paul yeah, George. He did break his leg in half. Yeah, I mean, that was the most horrific. That was a pretty horrific incident. And then he comes back from that early. Which people didn't think he'd come back when he did, and he did come back. And yeah, okay, he wasn't great when he came back, as good as he was before. But he's performed in the playoffs every year. He's a great player. I don't he was think... great in in uh, the second time they played Miami. Yeah. The first year, like great, basically he was Granger's protege. Right. 
And then the second year, Granger was out, and he stepped up in a way that I don't think anyone was prepared for. But you were prepared. You were on the sure. bandwagon. Early. They played the Knicks that that playoff series, and the Knicks were pretty big favorite. Yeah, they were like fifty five win team, seventy yeah, percent favorite to win that series. I think something like that, roughly. And it was just a joke. I thought that was the biggest joke ever. Yeah, I think the Pacers beat them four games to two and beat them handily. I remember you and I were emailing during that stretch, and you were. You were delighted. Like once or twice a year, there would be a situation like that where the public team. Sure. Just and the Knicks are like the skewed. perfect public team because it's right. New York and everyone thinks they're so good. And yeah. people still think they're good. Like this year, they're, they're, you know, Derek Rose is talking about them being a super team. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's sitting. gives you an idea of how skewed Well, the he did make is. the playoffs. He was at game four yesterday wearing a jogging suit with his kid <laughs> in city courtside. He French fries. Yeah, I saw that. My, my one gripe with Paul George, and I think you saw it in, in this Cavs series, even though he had to do a lot. I don't know if he's a high-volume offensive player. I think if he's your second-best player, that's great. But I like I don't think he has the ceiling that Jimmy Butler has. Jimmy Butler, I mean, we, we're going to talk about how Fred Hoiberg ran him into the ground yesterday, but Jimmy Butler, you can run the whole offense through him, and I feel like there's a level he can get to that Paul George is basically just a 40% shooter who, especially in the last five minutes, I feel like I can stop Paul George. Whereas Jimmy Butler, I feel like he can do more things. Sure, that's possible. I mean, I definitely, going into this year and maybe even during the year, uh, if I was asked who I liked better, Paul George or Jimmy Butler, I I, I would say Paul George easily. Really? But I've been that's rethinking it in the playoffs a little bit. I don't know. I mean, I, I might have underestimated Jimmy Butler a little on offense. You know, the interesting about Jimmy Butler is he doesn't look like he's nearly as tall it's Paul George because he's not yeah. as long, but they're not that different in height. I mean, there's like an inch or two between the two of them in height, and Jimmy's got that that hairdo that gives him a few more inches too. Right. Um, Very smart. It's a good <laughs> Dr. J in the ABA. He was six eleven. But that yeah. might be why his height is. Now that I think about it, that, might be why there's only, there's only a couple because they might have measured it up a little bit. Yeah. But um, possibly. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with just. I mean, I I think Paul George is, has a lot more upside if he's in the right situation i think yeah. like jimmy butler's playing probably about as good as he's playing he's probably not going to play any better and it's not like paul george is a young player and he's going to improve a lot but um but his situation might improve yeah his situation so if you put him on the celtics with isaiah being able to carry the offensive load isaiah can carry and then paul george doesn't have to totally worry about that and can kind of fit in i think he would be really good maybe yeah i think also just he doesn't. For I think since his injury, or he's not, he's not really a big foul drawer. He doesn't really drive a lot. Like he complains how he never gets it's true, never gets any foul calls. But he also takes a lot of mid range jumpers and he takes a lot of settles. Yeah, and shots like that, you're not going to get. You know, unless you're like you're not going to get a foul call on that or shooting foul on that. So um, that's something where maybe the right situation or the right offense or the right coach could maybe bring that out of him possibly he's the guy i look at when i look at jalen brown who i've had a roller coaster ride with this year who i loved <laughs> i was all in and then he hit the rick wall and now he can't even play in this playoff series but if you look at his stats same situation as george came out early um super athletic kind of thrown into the water yeah his stats offensively are basically the same as paul george rookie year if you look at their per 36 it's like almost exact interesting and Defensively, I think he has a chance to have the same kind of upside. Maybe Paul's, you know, maybe going to be a little bit stronger. I don't know how Jalen's body is going to go. Sure. But Paul George wasn't Paul George for a couple of years there. It really wasn't until Granger went down when he got through into the fire. And I wonder, like, that's why it's so hard for me to, to judge this Jalen Brown pick because they're such a good team. If with, especially with rookies, if they don't have it, what do you do? Like, they're trying to get the one seed. There's games with rookies where it's just like, oh, this guy's just running around like a chicken with his head cut off. The rookie wall is probably the most underrated thing in basketball. I mean, yeah. every player hits the rookie wall. No question. I mean, maybe LeBron, you can make the case that LeBron didn't. We can't count LeBron with any sure. conversation about basketball. In our model, we actually had we had like a, a rookie model, which wasn't very good. But even as as bad as it was, one of the things we had was like if if one of our rookies projected to be about as good as LeBron, we knew our model was just messed up because there's only one LeBron. <laughs> so That's have, So like Tyreek Evans' rookie year, he had like he, his rookie year was quite good. Yeah. And it compared very favorably to LeBron. And I he remember, was like 26 and five. Yeah, I remember looking at that and I was like, "There's something wrong with this. I don't care what his stats are. There's no way. There should LeBron needs. We need to figure out a way to make our model account for the fact that LeBron is LeBron and everyone else isn't." The models that the public uses, I think the biggest flaw with them is they don't account for 
durability and minutes. Yeah. You know, like you'll see some of the, oh, but his PR is where really, JaVel McGee is a 48 PR. He's, well, he's playing 13 minutes a game. Yeah. You can't extend that stuff out. I mean, that, that's the one thing that's, but you know, within that, you'll find some players who are playing just a few minutes a game who are quite good and then yeah. they're giving the opportunity when they're given. But so there's, you kind of have, that's why you, you can't just be a model. Or you have to like actually watch the games. And yeah, and sometimes to, bench guys are some common sense. Yeah, bench guys sometimes are really good in little seven minute spurts. Other guys are better when they play thirty five minutes. Yeah, and it's hard for them to just play two seven minute spurts, and that's all they do. Sure, you know, especially some shooters. What a, do you feel like the internet has caught up to some of the intelligence you had five years ago? Oh yeah, for sure. I would think so. Feels like the last two years, especially like I never even I never even knew what the hell offensive rating was. I just didn't understand it. And now, you know, I I wrote that I wrote my NBA book in like '09. I didn't have the benefit of really any of these advanced stats. And even I had a whole section about how overrated Oscar's triple double was because of the pace. And I just had to use like field goal attempts. <laughs> Look at all these field goal attempts that year. And now it's like we can really cut it down. It's funny though, looking at those offensive ratings which I think is a little bit of a better indicator than PER. Yeah. But like if you go back in history, it's pretty good. It's the guys that are in the 120s are the right guys. You know what I mean? Sure. And then even ahead of all of that stuff you have like the super quiet part of the internet where you have like the people who go to Sloan every year and yeah. write on blogs who are doing stuff that that is that is pretty pretty much super advanced, I would say. I mean, it's still there's still a lot of there's still a lot of dark holes and there's still a lot of weaknesses in some of those models but yeah it's caught up for sure there the stuff is really good stuff on the internet's pretty good especially if you know where to look i love this stuff i mean i've always for the last few years i love like the field goal percentages of where guys shoot in the floor like marcus smart who's one of the worst shooters i've ever seen he's good on corner threes and i watched that on the eye test i'm just like oh he's in the corner he's gonna make this but it's nice to have the numbers that back that up to be like oh if he's in these two spots he's really good and I think teams probably about, well, probably they were hiding it for a while, but I would say 2012, 2013 really started to look at location. Sure. And, oh, our offense does this. This guy's shot is open. You know, if we play the four, he's open in this spot. Let's go look at all the guys in the league who are good at that spot. And then they go and they sign them. It's funny. The people had, to give you an idea how far behind some teams were, like the, the Lakers in the year they lost to the Celtics, yeah. were encouraging open corner threes from the Celtics, who shot, right. I think, 1.4 points per That's the po yeah. Posey House, yeah, Pierce, Posey House, Ray, Pierce, Allen. Ray Allen. You could see it every time there was an open corner three. Lamar Owen would be streaking down the court for a fast break that never happened because the ball was going in. <laughs> and it's funny because I, I've told this story a few times, but I remember reading like Phil Jackson saying something about, yeah, we don't take those corner threes because they lead to fast breaks. And I was like, oh, mm. that might make sense. And so I watched every corner three that was taken in the NBA and chartered, you know, did it lead to a fast break or didn't it? And it actually was the case that corner threes led to less fast breaks yeah. than other shots from the three point line. So it's, it's almost like Phil Jackson doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> right. It's interesting <laughs> because that was like the first idea that I was like, hmm. And then the year Memphis was beating Golden State two games to one, and I forget who was, I guess was it, I guess Atlanta was the leading team and they were losing, and he was like, oh, can someone tell me how the three-point shooting teams are doing in the playoffs right now? He tweeted it, right? How's it going? Oh, God. And that was kind of, because people really thought, oh, okay, yeah, look at this, you can't, you know, people still said that you can't win being a three-point shooting team. Now in the NBA, like if you're not shooting threes, you're not even competing at all. When you watch a team like Houston, is that, were you kind of waiting for somebody to do this for years and years? Yeah, I remember even talking to Daryl about it, like Sloan, and I was, and just thinking like this team is ruining basketball's model. Like it breaks a model for sure. Yeah, because you, you know their three point rate was like climbing high. I think this year their three point rate, which is the ratio of three point shots to two point shots and and free throws, is like at in the four. Like they're off the chart, like literally off the chart. Like if you make the chart and you don't, they're completely in the top right corner, and everyone else is somewhere in the middle. And so the game does become more random, for sure. Um, and, and that's what the Celtics love. Sure. And the Celtics, it sounds it sounds like too pat to say this, but it really does come down most of the time with them whether they make three-pointers or not. Last night was an aberration because I think they were like 9 for 35 or something from three. Like they couldn't make them, but they still won. 
normally when they miss from three, it's a disaster because they're high volume. If they're under 35%, that's when I'm always like, uh oh, this is going to end up bad trouble. But Isaiah just played well in Hoiberg, coached one of the worst games that in the last really, couple of years. That was a crazy game. Yeah. I couldn't believe. They did I'm it saying. in, at the beginning of the fourth quarter, because Isaiah had four fouls for basically the whole second half. And there was one time in the, it was late third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter, when Butler got switched on him and he just backed him down and, and Isaiah wasn't going to guard him, foul him, anything. So Jimmy Butler basically just backed Back down and did a little two footer. And I'm like, Oh my God, they figured it out. And then they never did it again. Well, that's what's interesting about the playoffs is watching these adjustments these coaches make or don't make or the players make. In the first half, the Celtics were liberally switching that, that small to small pick and roll. Yeah. And so that's what the Bulls ran. And then in the second half, they fought through, Marcus Smart fought through one switch and Isaiah didn't have to guard him because they fought through the switch, but it wasn't really a good pick. So now the small, the small, maybe you can make an argument wasn't working, but then, uh, Stevens put Isaiah Thomas on Zipser and Zipser was just standing and that's a power forward. He doesn't move though. That's well, perfect for Isaiah, but he could set a screen and True. he could probably set a screen. That's, you know, decent enough where it's going to be tough to fight through that. And now you can get the switch you wanted. They never even tried. I mean, they just stood. They just they just stuck Zipser in the corner, and Isaiah had to do nothing. And I think that was the turning point in the game because it allowed him to play offense. It allowed him not to worry about foul trouble. And then, yeah, it was interesting. And then he didn't play Lopez enough. He didn't they, play Lopez did at all in the fourth quarter. Lopez kills us on the offensive. I mean, that's the one thing that's interesting. It's like, okay, will we really beat this team with our rebounding? They're going small. What are we going to do? Let's go small. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like the Celtics went small, but the Celtics were already small. Like they didn't, they, they played Amir Johnson, but then they would take him out. It wasn't like he played like the whole first quarter anyways. And so, um, they never were a big team to begin with. It's not like they always started Amir and they never started Amir and Horford anyways. So it's like, are they really going small? They're I don't, I never, I probably watched more Celtics this year than any year since 08. Amir hasn't ever really made sense, but for some reason when he's in there with Horford, there's these couple of these lineups that they're just their plus minus is fantastic, which is why they do it. Because they rebound. It's the only lineup where they But really not on not against rebound. the Bulls, they weren't and that's why it took yeah. them a while to realize like not the series for Amir, which yeah. a lot of coaches just they're nope, we're gonna play him. It worked all year and then they'll just they're out of the playoffs. Yeah. In this case they were like, Not the series for Amir and they went small. Which is funny because it's almost like professional wrestling. Like they, you, you go out of the ring. You hope the other guy comes out of the ring. Yeah, come out of the ring. Come out here. And they went. If it's small ball versus small ball, there's only three teams that can hang with the Celtics, and Chicago's not one of them. Yeah, I mean, there's probably more than three teams, but Chicago isn't one of them. Houston, Golden State, Cleveland. Who else? That's it. The, oh. the Celtics can hang with all those teams if you're going small and small. But as soon as they're the variable switches, I mean, they're it just trouble. depends. Like this is a bad matchup because. For lots of reasons, like not having a point guard if you're Chicago is pretty big, <laughs> right? <laughs> because well, explain the whole thing about how if you went Wade and Butler as your backcourt, the trouble that leads. Who's to. gonna guard Isaiah when that happens? Jimmy Butler, who's exhausted he's in the fourth play quarter, and yeah, and he can't chase Isaiah dead. around. That's, that's it's so in, Isaiah in this series is usually Isaiah is usually a liability because he's really bad on defense. Yeah, not a liability totally, but on defense he's a liability. But because they have no point guards. They have to play Isaiah Cannon to guard him. And now Isaiah Cannon on offense is, you know, he might get have a good game, but he's probably not going to have a great offensive game. He's not a good offensive player. He turns the ball over a lot, doesn't shoot. I got excited well. every time he took a shot. Yeah. Please keep shooting Isaiah Cannon. And I'm sure they got excited when he didn't turn it over. Like yeah. That was, oh, he got a shot off. That's good. Because he's, you know, he's, he's not up to that level at this point. He's not a primary, first of all, he's not a primary ball handling point guard. He's not a point guard. He's been a shooting guard most of his NBA career when he's played. He's always yeah. been the guy off the ball, not with the ball. So that's the reason why. Um, now could Wade guard, could you ask Wade to guard Jimmy no. or, or Isaiah Thomas for a little bit no. and maybe give Jimmy, give me Jimmy Butler a little bit of a break? He didn't sign up for that. Probably not. So what do you do? Wade didn't even sign up to, to help them out yesterday in game four for some reason. Where was he? Yeah. He, it's, it's not like he's done. Like this is not not somebody who should be at the end of his career. I can't believe that he couldn't have a bigger game than that. He might be battling something. I'm not sure. Maybe. I mean, yeah. He might've had a lot tough. of, yeah, he might've had a lot of, uh. Attrition. I watched um, the Houston Oklahoma City game yesterday, and it looked to me like Harden was like 
on drugs or something. I was like, what's wrong? With him? Right. What is, right. But then after the game, he said he, he hurt his ankle. He, he hurt his ankle in game three, and that's why he was. So you just never really know unless the player says there's something. Because Harden was terrible for the entire game. He was not, awful. Not just terrible, but it looked like he didn't want to play. And it makes sense if he had an ankle injury because he, he not that he didn't want to play, it's just he was hurting, he was laboring. They used him almost as a as a decoy. It was I mean, it was weird. He would first of all he would sit there on defense, he's already guarding Roberson, not having to do anything, but he would just wouldn't even help that. He wasn't even moving at all on defense. And then on offense, he would get the ball, and, and he was just deferring. He wasn't really – when he yeah. get it, he would he'd settle for a bad shot. Every once in a while, he would drive and drive and bounce it off his knee out of bounds or whatever. I saw really what you said on Twitter it. about you'd think that it's indisputable Houston has a better supporting cast. And I actually agree with you, but – You want to dispute I, the indisputable. <laughs> indisputable. Um, I do think OKC has good players that they have put in a position to fail for most of this year. The way basketball is played – when you're basically saying to just about everyone on your team, you, you're you here to help Russ. Oh, he needs you now. Now get right. I, it's not how it works. You can't do it that way. Old Depot is somebody to me that I think could be a really good offensive player against, especially against second units. That's one thing where they could play him against second units more and let him carry it a little bit. Like, I don't know why they're playing Norris Cole. Um, that, and that helps him because it's giving him confidence. He's getting reps, creating the offense, making plays, and then in crunch time when he's out there with Westbrook, they can actually go to him and he can do something. When you look at the when you like line the, the teams up and you compare them, you could I could see how you could make that argument. And some of them maybe arguably are on like in isolation or like in a, just looking at each individual player alone, better players. Like Oladipo probably, if you look at him and you had to draft him or whatever, let's say, assume these players are all unknown players and they're free agents, you'd say probably Oladipo is better than Lou Williams, right? Of course. Oh yeah. But Lou Williams does one thing really well, and that's score, bas- score baskets and draw fouls. And get fouls. And in, in a team concept, and just not even a team concept, they're just better basketball players in this day and age because, look, that Houston team is like the biggest jabroni team ever. I mean, <laughs> all they do is shoot threes and draw those like chintzy fouls where yeah. they're like coming off a screen. But that works in today's game. You can't play basketball. Like Ryan Anderson has had a terrible playoff series, but him being two or three feet behind the three-point line and still being a threat, that's a valuable offensive commodity. Couldn't Doug McDermott do that for the Thunder, though? You're just not going to respect him as much, I don't think. He's not as good a three-point shooter as Ryan Anderson. You mean Ryan Anderson on open three? Like I did a thing where I just compared like open three-point shots. Right? Yeah. So players wide open on three. This isn't a proxy for who's a better basketball player, but right. it is a proxy for who's a better three-point shooter. Right. And it is a better for who's a better... It is a good proxy for who's a better offensive player. Um, I mean... I think the best player shooting threes for Oklahoma City was Oladipo, and he was like sub 30, I forget, but 30, 33, 32%. Houston had guys that were in the 40s. I yeah, mean, three of them. Yeah. And that's a, in today's basketball game, that's, that's a skill that makes you a better basketball player. It creates more lanes for your other players. It, you, know, you get three points when it goes in, it's just it's better. Hold this thought. I want to keep talking about that series. I want to talk about texture really quick. How do we keep this podcast fresh? I read a ton of stuff every day, including a bunch of magazines on the Texture app. Texture gives me access to hundreds of magazines like the Atlantic, New York Magazine, the New Yorker, and SI all in one place on my tablet or phone. With daily recommendations, interactive features, videos, and more, the Texture app makes it easy to find and enjoy the articles I want to read. It's even searchable, so you can mark what you like, check out back issues, or view bonus content. No wonder it was selected as one of Apple's top 2016 iPad apps. I read just about everything on my iPad. Do you read stuff on your iPad? No. I love reading on my iPad. Texture has been a godsend. Maybe now I will. With Normally Texture, nine ninety nine a month for access to over 200 magazines. But if you sign up right now, texture.com slash BS, you get a 14-day free trial. What's better than that? Why well, subscribe to a couple of mags when you can subscribe to all of them? Start your free trial. Download the Texture app. Go to texture.com slash BS for your 14-day free trial. Who did you think was going to win Oklahoma City versus Houston heading into the series? Houston. Yeah. yeah. I thought Oklahoma City could make some adjustments and cause them some difficulty. And Rebounding and defense, right? Yeah. Rebounding defense and Russ could have won the series, I feel like. Sure. And every game, there's been some close games. It's not the thing about a seven-game series, anything can happen. But I, I did think if I had to guess which team would win the series, I would, I would say Houston. What was the biggest surprise in round one for you? Um... Not even like who's winning, but just like something you didn't expect. With I didn't expect the Bulls to have that much success with Rondo in the first two games. 
like versus Boston. I didn't see that coming. And I, I was really there think, for game I one. I can tell you, nobody it. saw it coming. I didn't really think. It's not, it's not like I sat there and like really studied the series and was like, yeah. "Oh, what am I going to do with this series?" But, um, but after it was while, while it was happening, I was kind of like, "Oh yeah, this this is kind of surprising." That's really disappointing. I'm not a huge. I'm I'm actually a pretty big Rondo. You know, not I don't. And I'm not a big Rondo fan at all. That's putting right. it putting it mildly. But he's he played really well for them in the first two games. Yeah, and, I, and it's kind of disappointing that he got injured because I think it would have made that series like. A lot more interesting. I wasn't disappointed at all. No, it didn't seem that way. Um, he definitely knew where all the plays were going. And yes. I, I will say, though, now that you watch Isaiah in game four, looked like Isaiah again. How many times during the season did he just rip losses and turn them into wins? Yeah, that's game another. one. The game four, Isaiah in game one, they win game one, you yeah. know, because he did that over and over again this season. That's another thing. It's like yeah. this, this poor guy is playing under an unrealistic amount of stress and yesterday heartache. was the first day where he looked like the guy i watched all season i just don't understand how uh how he was even able to play like i get I that either. it's a release and so but it just must have been so difficult i can't I'm, i've never lost anyone in my life like yet i'm pretty like none of my I've siblings never been to, none of my so I, I can't imagine i've never been to a game where the, a guy cried in the pregame intros and then played i mean think about how much emotion you have to then just get thrown out you're in a playoff basketball sure. game and I definitely think it affected him. And, it has to, yeah. And, you know, I I think yesterday was the first day there was a little light at the end of the tunnel for seemed that him way. looking like him. Yeah. The other thing was Smart was just horrendous the whole series. And then <laughs> in the second half, started doing all that Marcus Smart, how do you even measure this guy with analytics stuff? Like, he just does things, you know? And a lot, most of the time, you're terrified. It's like, no, no, he's a no, no, yes guy. There's no question. He'll do a dumb foul every once in a while. He'll do a dumb pass. He'll he'll lose his con. But then he has these moments where he's just there, sure, in the right spots. By the way, those are the guys that measure well in analytics. Really? How yeah, come? It's, it's like the Badier thing. Like the you know, it's, it's, it's the guys who do the things that don't get measured in the box score. Yeah. You know, they set good screens. They fight through screens. They switch when they're supposed to. They help. They retreat back to their defender. They. It's just that stuff measures in. And because the other team scores less when they're on the court, maybe his team scores a little bit more efficiently. So that type of stuff does does measure well. In it. So he's the new Badia, is what you're saying? No, I'm just saying. That's... Is he a Sloan Conference panel? <laughs> no, not at all. But I'm just saying that that <laughs> that those guys they don't if you don't if you have a guy who does well, your team performs well with them when he's on the court, but they don't really show up in the box score. There's analytics that kind of show that, and Badia was like the leader for that. Way Who's the leader now? Um. I don't know. I'd have to think about it, I suppose. There's a couple different guys that are pretty good. I, You know, someone like Beverly probably measures pretty well just because yeah, he defends other teams, point guards, and, and he does really well against Curry. There's guys that are that measure well and that analytics loves even more than, like, Chris Paul. Uh, that He measures really, really good with the eye test with basic box score statistics, and then when the analytics takes a look at him, they, he's even better. Chris Paul is the triple crown of that. He's eye test... Yeah. He's regular metrics and he's advanced metrics. Sure. He's all three. Yeah, LeBron. You know, there's the really great players measure well in both, and then there's players who are kind of underrated. I told you I don't count LeBron for any of these discussions. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. So he's a robot sent from the future to destroy us. Where? What about Westbrook? Where did, where did your analytics have? It's he's probably the most confusing player that we've ever tried to measure with this stuff. I mean, no, there's no basis in history, at least in modern statistics, since the play-by-play -play data became available for a player with that high of a usage yeah i mean that like i tried to write that five weeks ago and everybody's like you hate westbrook it's like i'm just pointing out that nobody's ever hogged the ball like this yeah and so the, a model would have a lot of difficulty with that they just yeah. wouldn't understand what's going on why does why is our upward cap for usage is like 38 or whatever percent yeah. this guy's in the 40s and or higher and so that's there's that. He isn't that efficient, but he gets to the free throw line a lot. I don't know. It's in our model doesn't think a lot of him. I don't defensively, think defensively, especially. I would guess this year he didn't do too well in the model. Yeah, probably not. I mean, I don't know. It's he's a, like you said, he's very polarizing. I love watching him play. Me too. But I'm not sure I would want him on my team if I was a, 
if I, if I had a team. I don't that's, know. I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm just saying I'm not sure that I would. That's the crux of the Westbrook issue. Everyone's like, love watching him play. Respect what he does. Would you want to play with him? No. No, right. never. I wouldn't. But, 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 but I you, love watching him. So because he's not on guys, my team. His guys, seem, the guys on his team seem to love him. So it's interesting. Like, so it's like Stockholm Syndrome, though. That's what happened with Kobe. I, I don't know. In 2010, Kobe's teammates were like, Kobe's a great guy. I really like him. Like, it was like they'd been brainwashed. I don't know, man. When he, that game against Orlando, when he, no, it is true. They, they were, they're in his corner. They really do love playing for him. It's, it's interesting. That's it's like the, a cult over there, though, I feel like a little bit. Oklahoma City. Yeah, maybe. A lot of young players. They always go for the young. Yeah. Elias Sova, they had to trade. He's too old. He's on to us. We got to trade him for another impressionable <laughs> young guy. <laughs> yeah, possibly. I, don't know. I think Westbrook's incredible. And I also think that if somebody's going to have the ball that much, it's impossible for them to win a playoff series. I just don't – there's literally not one example in the history of basketball that this has led to real success. It doesn't work. You need five guys. But if you look at that team after they lost Durant. Yes. What path to drop led to some success? Like That's that the thing. They couldn't, this, I don't know if this was the best way to do it, but it certainly is the most – I mean, you're not going to win a championship. You're probably not going to get to the conference finals anyways. And so your goal is to maximize seats, attention – Whatever this did, it. it was very smart. If we forget that sometimes this is an entertainment product too, it's not just always all about winning. I mean, it is about winning, but there's going to be lots of years where you're just not going to be able to compete. Like if you're in the East, you're just basically waiting for LeBron to get traded to the West, to sign with him in the West, or retire. Yeah, you're not going anywhere probably. So what do you do in the interim? Or frame him for a murder? You could do that. There, I mean, there's a that. lot. Of, there's there's some lots nefarious of options you, <laughs> you could, could do. Frame him for a murder. Um, yeah, I mean, they, people always ask me these last couple months, like where were the Celtics in the trade deadline? And first of all, Butler and George were not available because it's both of those teams are going to wait to see if the Lakers have a pick. I think they were available. I don't think that. I know for a fact Indy wasn't. I know for a fact that they went all in with a Godfather offer and Bird wouldn't even call him back. Jimmy Butler, I think the Bulls. You mean, uh, the, oh, okay. I see. They, the Indy just wasn't trading him. They, it wasn't happening in February. That's a mistake. I would be very surprised if he resigned with Indy. So here's why I don't think it was a mistake. Because if the Lakers get a top three pick, now you have two suitors. You play uh, off okay. each other. Sure. I think, I think to me, so. it's, I mean, it's, I, I would say it's a mistake if 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 they waited till the very end of the. Three. Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. But if you sure. and I were running the Bulls or the Pacers, and we we're like, oh, the Celtics want Jimmy or Paul, we would meet about it, and we would be like, we can't do it until we find out if the Lakers have that pick. If there's ever a candidate to overpay for a player, it's the Los Angeles Lakers. With magic and trying to throw the scent off this whole bus family disaster, you know, if they get the third pick, they'll offer the third pick, Brandon Ingram, but, but, more picks, whatever. But who's this? I mean, Paul George is unrestricted. He could just go In to the Lakers for yeah. But you don't have to. You, he could just go to the Lakers for nothing eventually. True. If it, well, that's the thing that Carmelo could have done that year, right? Yeah. Could have just waited to sign with the Knicks and instead he's like, no, no, I want it because you want to get paid. And they had to give up Gallinari and fell and all these all these assets. Yeah, a couple how'd, draft picks. How'd that work out for Melo? It looked, worked out terrible. Yeah. So Paul George should should probably wait. Yeah, but uh, but with the Celtics, back to the point, which is like, I just don't think that they thought the team was good enough, and that there wasn't anyone out there, unless they could get Butler or George, which wasn't on the table. You know, Celtics would be a, would 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 be a scary team with. With those two, with they would one probably of them. Yeah. yeah. With one of those two, but they would probably be. I mean, I don't know. Cleveland. Everyone's like, "Oh, their defense. No one's ever played with a defense this bad." But their offense is pretty ridiculous. I mean, they don't. It's not that they don't care about defending; they don't really have to. Like LeBron a, surrounded by shooters is about as unstoppable. That LeBron as you and get. the bench unit is ridiculous. Yeah. it's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. I don't know how you stop it. I th I. The one thing with LeBron that I think over everything else that's been the most amazing is the injury luck. I've never seen anything like it. Like Blake Griffin's been hurt eleven times. I don't think that's luck, though. <laughs> I don't think that's. I think well, I do part, think there's it, it, just one time roll an ankle or <laughs> like just anything. Like it's it's but almost I, impossible. Well, I think he ha he he's 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 his skill is he's also durable. That's a he's skill. the most durable player since Kareem. Sure. Kareem, I mean, even Kareem broke his hand once punching Kent Benson. Like, LeBron's never had an injury. That's, yeah, he's never... He's yeah. never really missed significant time for anything. And in the playoffs, 
which like even Bill Russell got hurt in the playoffs once. Like LeBron's never had a playoff injury. Listen to you. <laughs> You're capping for a LeBron injury. No, I'm not capping anything. <laughs> I'm just putting LeBron, out a lucky secret. LeBron. He's never gotten injured. I'm just saying. Injury. A murder. How about for a murder? It's just like, it's like take it easy. I'm desperate. <laughs> no, but it is like. Injury luck decides the title pretty much every year. Yeah, but there's some players who just always get injured, and they're just like, "Oh man, how unlucky!" It's like at some point, you yeah, know, I don't think Blake not... Griffin's unlucky anywhere. Yeah, there's a durability issue with some players. Blake Griffin, Kevin O'Connor has the complete list, but it's like it's so long you can't read it. Who's the on... other player that I'm completely for injuries? Yeah, that I'm just complete. That's always has a different injury, and it's like, oh, he's injured again. <sighs> it's an NBA. I just for some reason it'll come to me in a minute. On a playoff team. Just, a, just a player that ever is always a good player, but who's always getting injured. And, oh, Anthony Davis. Oh yeah, that's a good one. So, like, that's a, do you that's really a fear. think Anthony Davis has just been super unlucky, or is he probably he's got like he's not all the way to what that guy had in that Bruce Willis comic book movie, Unbreakable. He's not all the way there, but he's on that spectrum where he's he's going to be injury prone. I think some pe some people just know how to avoid injury, like. That even you see it as kids. Like we, there's certain kids, like in my son's class, who always had these little injuries. Yeah, my son's never been injured. He's like tumbling off couches and <laughs> falling down the stair. Like he just doesn't get hurt. And I feel like LeBron is the greatest possible version of that. Yeah, LeBron. Think of how many times he's crashed into people, and he's just, he's just one of the greatest athletes of all time. I, I would say he's in the top five ever in any sport. And it's it's also the type of thing where if you start getting a couple injuries, it exacerbates things because now you're favoring this niece and you have problems with the other right. niece. So it just kind of snowballs. Plus, the radiation. You imagine Anthony Davis is in that taking that MRI once a, once every oh two God, games. Yes. <laughs> That's probably the biggest fear for him right now. Is well, it? you've noticed you've been to a couple of Clipper games this year. Like you've noticed, Blake athletically is not the same guy. I mean, now no. it doesn't matter anymore. But he just he used to jump over people. Now yeah. he's going under and around people. Well, he wrote that article where he's like, "I'm not doing that anymore. I'm trying to prolong my career." I need to become a mid-range specialist, and it's just kind of like, okay, but... Your athleticism was what made you special. No, not even. I'm just saying, like, well, you're doing that. Sure, it's going to prolong your career, but you're not going to be as good a player as you used to be. That's, right. That's not a good way to play basketball. Uh, quick break to talk about Proper Cloth. Propercloth.com. Every guy knows it's hard to find a dress shirt that fits. Maybe the collar's too tight, the sleeves are too long, the shirt's too loose. I have some good news. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. Create a custom shirt size in seconds by just answering 10 easy questions, no measuring required. Tate, have you done this yet? Not yet. Okay. Way to go, Tate. Over 500 fabric styles to choose from, everything from classic business to casual shirts, all high quality starting at just 85 bucks. Proper Cloth has hundreds of five-star reviews on Google and Yelp. It's the highest rated custom shirt maker on Google. Google. Who would have the most five-star reviews on Yelp in the NBA? Probably LeBron. LeBron. Yeah. Maybe a lot of Westbrook, and then there would be like the Westbrook counter crew would be putting one star reviews to but try. Then to... there'd be the guys who write reviews, just like they'll have like a thousand five hundred reviews, and they're the most they're reviewing the most ridiculous. They'd be like talking about Kawhi's defense. <laughs> Those guys. <laughs> Find out why GQ calls Proper Cloth their favorite online custom shirt maker. Go to their easy to use website, make a custom profile, order from your phone. By the way, Proper Cloth guarantees a perfect fit. Remakes are free. The Proper Cloth team makes it super easy to do. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Look your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS and save $20 on your first shirt. Clippers. Blake Griffin. This is year six. Blake, Chris, DeAndre have all been on the same team now for six years. Back in the day early on, we used to blame Vinny Del Negro. You and I especially. You're like, <laughs> I mean, what is this guy? Yeah. Come on. What's going on here? I remember there was one time when uh, when Michael Smith predicted their play coming out of a timeout. That happens, though. No, but he was just like, here's what they're going to do. And I'm like, this is a terrible sign that Michael Smith knows <laughs> their play coming out of the timeout. Yeah. Um, so then he leaves and Doc comes in, who you and I had always been a little suspicious about as a game coach, but respected. Yeah, of course. Better than Vinny. It all crests in 2015, the Houston series. When were you at that game? When they blew the 25 point lead or whatever that was? I went to every game that's not that one. I missed that was game six, was it? Game five or, or game six or whatever. They lost the next game. It was game five, yeah. And they lost game six and game seven. Yeah. No, I didn't go to that game. And then last year, all hell breaks loose. Now this year, 
kind of the last stand. Blake gets hurt, he's out. And now it looks like, what would you do? What would you do if you're running the Clippers? Would, I don't, had, I don't, do you run this back for year seven? Yeah. I don't do you know. pay Blake $28 million a year next year or whatever he's going to get? I mean, you could say the, the, the thing that's interesting is like, what do you do if you're every team that's not Golden State? Because they have the NBA by the, I mean, they've got, that's it. They're the team that's probably only going to be the team that wins championships. So, um, what would I do? I don't know. I, I think that the model of player, or excuse me, coach and president of basketball operations is a terrible model. I, I think guys, I, that, I would like to agree. I think that, <laughs> I think that you need someone who is able to study just other players and the draft and strategy and all those other things. And you can't be doing that and coaching. And the Celtics team. have two GMs basically. Sure. Not to mention a whole staff underneath them. Yeah. And doc for two years tried to do both jobs, coach and GM, which is just it's a suicide. suicide mission. And I, I don't think it's the, you know, it's not the same talent, the ability to coach and be a leader of, of men and drawing up plays, et cetera. It's not the same talent as putting together a roster. Well, Phil Jackson, it worked out though. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, no, it didn't work right. out at all. Right. So, um, what do I do? I don't know. I probably, I probably would have wanted to trade Blake a couple years ago. Last year was the year when Denver was ready to give up whatever to get him to get a superstar, and they probably could have gotten Jokic or and Gallinari don't and you think Will they Barton. Could have traded him to. Oklahoma City at some point for someone. I think the Celtics would have would have jumped at him big time last year. I think for they would have given picks, up both yeah. broken picks. And it's just it just it just shows you how hard it is to be a power forward in the NBA who plays his style. Yeah. He's not someone who crashes a lot in, underneath the basket, and he doesn't stretch it all the way out to the three point line. So you're just sitting in that point seven point eight points per shot range of those long twos that he likes to take. And then DeAndre is there too and he's clogging, clogging that least part up. of the lane. That's yeah. bad. So it's just it's just it's unless he develops a, like a terrific it's just sad because he is a ridiculous I mean he's a great ball handler. He's a great playmaker. They can play fast. He's a he's a spectacular talent. He's just in an era that makes him less valuable, I think. Well I always wonder like this Westbrook Durant thing and how it played out where clearly both guys needed their own situation. I wonder if that's the case with Blake and Chris. And let's say, let's say they trade Blake to. I, don't, I guess Blake's going to opt out, and I don't know. I forget how they change the sign and trade rules, so I, don't, I might not right. be right on this. But let's say they just said Blake, we'll re-sign you and we'll flip you, you know, in two months for for this. I think you have to wait even longer than that. But anyway, yeah, they did change it. I I hate. I think it's they, December thirteenth, yeah. right? You oh it. shit! Yeah. All right, under the old sign and trade rules. <laughs> <laughs> right. But like, you know, put him on Orlando. And Orlando sends a like a three for one trade, which normally I'm against, but if you're the Clippers and you're able to get like Aaron Gordon as the Blake replacement and a couple other guys and who else would you want on that team though? And that's true. Well, all right, so this is, it's a double hypothetical. So if you can do a side of trade, Orlando had guys you wanted. Yeah. But no, I think Denver is a good example too of But they're not getting Jokic now. No chance. Jokic if they traded Jokic for Blake, I think there would be a riot in, I mean, in just, Denver. They'd, they'd be lot. get super stoned first, but then they would yeah. have a riot. Yeah. No, I actually I don't even know where where the where the Blake market is now. They to your point, they missed it cuz like a year ago, I think it was much higher. Now it's like okay, see, I could see doing it. The Knicks can never be ruled out under any circumstances for anything. They could or a team like Brooklyn. Yeah, they could certainly play the triangle with Blake. That would be fun. Or, you know, I, I just don't know what he does because if I'm him and I'm this banged up, I'm grabbing the money at that what point. Is, what does Chris Paul do is what I want to like? I know they <laughs> he was on the, the, the union whatever leadership. What What is he? He's like a union they, rep. They're going to call it the Chris Paul rule. Yeah. But he like, you know, they specifically, him and LeBron specifically created this collective bargaining agreement thing that allowed them to maximize the amount of the Chris Paul rule. Yeah. And so now does he leave though? It's, it's just, five, it's five years, 201 million. It might even be more because the cap went up a little bit. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. If you were him, would you go to Milwaukee? I theorized this on Friday. If you're just trying, if Chris Paul's like, I just want to win a anyone, championship. I wouldn't go to Milwaukee. You would. <laughs> no, I would not. Oh, you would not. I want to go to Milwaukee. Where would you go if you're Chris Paul and you want to win a title? Oh, if I, yeah, I mean, I would go to the East. Old. He's too. Yeah, he would go to the East for sure. 
He's probably too old to go to. I don't think Milwaukee, even with Chris Paul, is ready. I don't think. I mean, I don't know. Um, he's he would go if you want to win a championship. You probably go to San Antonio. Is this Golden State thing? This is just where we're going to be the rest of the decade. Probably we'll see. I don't know. The Caps. What ends? It's different. Once you start winning championship, stuff changes. Like. Obviously, guys, you guys feel like they won the title, and now it's, now like, right, it's I okay. Get paid. Now I want to get paid. Yeah. I want to get out of here. Maybe someone felt like, oh, I won the title, and I didn't get enough credit because I did more than this guy did. You know, just never really know. The disease of more, as Pat Riley called it. Yeah, you yeah. just never really know. So, but as constructed in the way things are now, it's pretty hard to beat that team for the next however long they're. Houston, I think, created the best possible team that hypothetically could beat them, sure. just from. They get the two monster Harding games and the two games where they hit a ton of threes. All the games they hit a ton of threes. They're just going to – and they got – they're smart enough to realize that, look, we are not as good as this team. We need to junk up this game as much as possible and create as much variance as possible. Right. Which is what what they're good at. With a ton ton of threes, deep threes, uh, it's going to be interesting if they match up. Durant's the X factor because now that Curry's playing better and they they have their mojo back a little bit and then – when they play that lineup with Durant and Draymond, nobody has the guy to match up against Durant in that situation. Like Washington, fun team. Yeah. I really enjoy wa- watching Washington. I think they could score with Golden State, but the X factor would be you can't play Boyan. Washington's against a Durant. fun team if you make a rule that says only five players are allowed to play for an entire game. Right. Because their bench is just a joke. It's just it's Boyan. It's ridiculous. It's like he watched like Brandon Jennings had a few moments where he just went and had like a great moment in game two. But if you watch him on defense, you no, watch Boy on he's, defense, he's you watch Ubre, who everyone thinks is a great defender because every once in a while he'll deflect. I, I like Ubre. Am I wrong to like Ubre? He's he's great at getting those deflections. He does he's brain, super long. He did brain fart a couple of times in these Dude, playoffs. Dude, he's yeah, he, he looks out he of it. He plays like right up on players, and then they blow by him. He gets he's always out of position. He's it's it's he's like a high variance player because he's going to get a steal and for a dunk, which he may miss. Right, because he missed a couple of those two, or he's gonna just get some guy backdooring him, or leaving him open, or he's just gonna run up on someone and foul him when they're in the penalty. He did that twice in game two, just for no reason, fouled off the ball when they're in the penalty because he wanted to play real close. I think it's young exuberance. Yeah, he seems like he's got some exuberance problems. Mm. I do like that Washington team, and I am hoping that I think Washington Celtics would be so much fun. I I I swear they haven't played since like 1984 in a playoff series. I would love that one. And I would just be great. It'd be every game would be 120 to 117 or 128 to 124. That's a team though. How how, where do you put Isaiah in that versus that team? That's our big matchup problem with them. You put them basically in Otto Porter, and you just kind of hope that that Porter they don't set do pick and rolls and you know yeah switch it so Isaiah's on yeah. Ball. Isaiah can't guard John Wall. Most people can't guard John Wall. No, but Isaiah can't guard John Wall. He can't guard Bradley Beal. No, that's a disaster. He probably can't even guard Kelly Oubre Jr. Probably can't guard Kelly Oubre Sr. It's, it's terrible. So it's it's tough. It's the Isaiah conundrum was that team in Toronto were weirdly that the, even Cleveland, they could match up better with it because they just put him on one of the shooters. But on Toronto, they, they had nobody to put him against. Yeah. And then on top of it, it's the one team that Jonas just kills the Celtics. He just yeah. loves it. What would you do at Toronto, Milwaukee? Where do you see that one going? Um, we should do a quick speed round. Sure. Uh, I see. I think Milwaukee is the better team for that matchup, but I don't know if they're ready to win. It seems like we've been here before with these young playoff teams and bunch of smoke getting blown up the asses yeah. and. It's tough. They they haven't been there before. Brogdon to me in Game Four looked, it looked it looked to me like he was feeling it for the first time. Yeah. Like, oh, we really need you. And it's like, I'm a rookie. I just started playing twenty. Games they need ago. a big game from Middleton if they're yes. going to. And he, he sucked in was game terrible four. in Game Four. Yeah, awful. So I don't. Know, I see that series. I, I if I had to, I would probably. I mean, I don't know. I I think Milwaukee has a chance to win that series. I would probably. The history of this stuff is with young teams. As the series goes along, it's better for them because they just get a little more comfortable each game. And each and the fact that it's 2-2 and they have a chance to come back to Milwaukee if they won game five, I still really like this Toronto but how But how about the fact that they were up two games to one and they had a chance to go up three games? That's, I know. that's huge. That's the swing of that is just like the, that's just huge. That's a huge swing. It was weird that they didn't see it coming 
what Toronto was obviously going to do in that game, which was just make it ugly, put PJ Tucker on Giannis. Well, what was slow really, it down. What was really weird is that Toronto didn't realize that Norman Powell should have been playing more. Right. That was for the, the big, That was the that was the matchup change, the lineup change that really switched things for that, that yeah. series. Because Which arguably should have happened in game everyone one. Everyone on my Twitter feed was going crazy. I people love Norman Powell. Yeah. So it was uh, like you know, there's all these pictures of Norm from Cheers when he was <laughs> like when he played well. So that's that'll be interesting how they counter that. Is that the biggest toss up series for you right now? The Clippers one is a pretty big toss up series too. I mean, any series that's two two is a pretty big. T- I mean, I think Boston's. I I I think Boston's definitely in the driver's seat. I think we're series. okay in that series. Um, I think Atlanta Washington is kind of a toss up too. I mean. If you look at, I thought Washington was so much better than Atlanta to begin the series. I just thought this is like, but if you look at the first two games Washington won, they didn't win. I mean, those games were in doubt. They were not go away wins, and a couple of things had to go right for Washington to win those games, and they did. Yeah, and I don't know Atlanta has way more options to make changes. Like that's always thing in a series. You always look at like, okay, who you know who has the ability to make like a lineup change or switch things around. Who has that ability because they have the pieces, and then will they actually do it? And Toronto can, fits that mo- mode too. Yeah, a lot of weird flexibility. They could do some different things, yeah. and, and they might find something that works. Some of it's just random; they're just plugging in different things, and it just happened to work. Oh wow, look how good this is working! Yeah. But what what move does Washington have other than just playing better? I mean, they have no depth whatsoever. If they have to play as fast as possible with Wall in transition, and they have to hope that Atlanta, I mean, if Atlanta plays Dwight Howard less. Crashes the boards less, plays better on offense. Play Dwight Howard less is a good playoff recipe. Yeah, it's a bad matchup for them. He's probably past his prime. That would be that's a fair. I would say definitely. Yeah, pretty fair thing to say. Um, and you know, Muscala kind of stretches it out. If they want to play a center, they can play him, and then they can just play. They could just play small. It's not like you have to really worry about Gortat. Oh no, what are we gonna do if we go small? Gortat's right. gonna kill us. The Polish hammer. It's not. It's, I mean, he's a good player. He's a fine player, but he's not gonna kill you. I've been small. stunned by Schroeder, who I was never a fan of. I always thought he played one unreal. Of my, one of my history. six or seven. I, I had him in the bottom six or seven for starting point guards the whole season. He played unreal in game three. Wow. I love John Wall. I I can't believe he doesn't have a shoe contract. I think he's breathtaking. He's not a good defensive player. He is a good defensive player. I feel like he's not, though. I feel like he has the tools to be a good defensive player, but I don't see it. Like, to me, Schroeder should, should, shouldn't should be just lighting them up like this. That's the has so, got to take that on himself well, and be like, adjust, I got to stop him. They've got to adjust their scheme a little bit and make it so that he's primarily guarding him when they run pick and roll because that's what's killing it. It's not, you know, they're not ISOing and just, or, or posting no. them up. It's pick and roll. You need to make an adjustment. The guy comes, got to come over. Now the ball swings and it comes back to him. So there, it's hard because anytime you have a lot of that's a, that's a difference between Westbrook and other players, right? Westbrook in pick and roll, you can pack the paint in because there's no shooters, right? But Atlanta, they've got the floor spread out a lot more, and so it creates those lanes. And that's like the that's that's the big that's a big difference that people don't really look, account for. Tonight is too. Tonight it could be too. Tonight two. it could be too too. He's would, gotta win that, he's gotta win that matchup. Gotta crush that matchup. They played so That's bad. That's their biggest in game advantage. Three. That was like a, it's some of these teams that show up and just play so bad. It's just so interesting. I mean, the playoffs, it's usually an afternoon game and it's, it's, and you're just looking like, what is going on? I think those early afternoon playoff games almost are unbettable. They're it's tough. like, they're tough you just to don't know what the fuck's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, they're tough to watch. Right? You don't know if the guys have been out the night before. Sometimes they played 36 hours before the game and they're tired from that. or You just don't know. There was a game seven or a game five where Rudy Gay was at the Fantasy Factory dunking off trampolines till 2 o'clock in the morning <laughs> by the night before. He was like literally the night before and the game was a noon Pacific start. Okay. And I was just like, Rudy. You play tomorrow, bro. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and then I remember just watching. He was terrible. I remember watching. I was like, dude, what are you doing? Why are you jumping off of trampolines into foam ball? Like he was at literally jumping off of trampolines, dunking for everyone at the fantasy factory until two or three in the morning. Might not have been that late. It was pretty late though. The other thing with NBA players is they're on this body clock schedule where you know they're they're trying to peak it from seven thirty to ten at night. They go, they eat dinner afterwards. It's just different. They're usually up to like three thirty four in the morning. So you throw that random. It's just twelve thirty or it's just, and it's two like o'clock the, East and Coast it's time. It's brutal, too, and it's just like it's it's yeah. It's, you never know. Do one more for uh, Quicken Loans when it comes 
down to the massive decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone you can trust who has your best interests in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Don't waste time searching through stacks of paperwork with Rocket Mortgage. You can securely share your financial info to get a mortgage approval within minutes. You can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you, whether you're looking to buy a home or refinance your existing mortgage. You can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. Skip the bank. Skip the waiting. Go completely online at quickenloans.com slash Bill Simmons, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. Again, quickenloans.com slash Bill Simmons. So you think that's the most confusing series, Toronto, Utah, Atlanta? A little bit. Oh, Utah Clippers. Clippers. We thought Clippers but was Utah a little Clippers, bit. But Utah Clippers, these guys, you never even know who's playing. Yeah. That, that's been the toughest thing for me is like, I almost want to do this series again where just everybody's in it. I want to know what happens. Yeah. Now it's like, well, I we mean, Gobert this? looks like he's all the way there. Looks like he probably, I mean, he's not all the way there, but he played good enough in the first game back. Now he's got, you know, bothers some shots. Yeah. Uh, Iso Joe was unreal. 20 straight points, either scored or assisted down the stretch. That's amazing. They had no answer for that. Rodney Hood is the all-time hit or miss right. guy in a playoff team, and he was actually good yesterday. Doc Rivers cut Joe Ingles for That's a guy great. who now plays for Jang Zhu, Monkey King in China. Who did he cut him for? I forget. <laughs> Jared Cunningham. <laughs> Jang, Jang Zhu, Monkey King. That's literally the team the guy's playing for. In his defense, I watched Joe Ingles play last year, and I'm like, I think I even tweeted about it a couple of times. I'm like, what am I missing with Joe Ingles? But I just couldn't like get it. That's a stereotype, I think. Like, if Maybe you look is. at Joe Ingles, you're not like, oh, that guy's an NBA. Like, if someone, if you're at a club and someone, and you're a girl, and someone's like, oh, that guy plays in the NBA, you'd be like, get the fuck out of here. Right. He's, he's like Marty NBA. Conlon for he's this generation. Like, he looks, yeah, he looks like Biff, like from the future and back to the future. He's like but he wasn't, balling. this year he's actually making threes. I thought when they had him guarding Chris Paul at the end of game three was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. It, it wasn't completely a disaster. He's a good defender. Yeah. That's, it's because he's he's got really he's got a lot of length and he's smart. He knows angles. He knows where to push a guy. He knows how to like use his hands on the hips and move him this way, move him that way. So, yeah. Uh, you know what was interesting about that game was the Clippers played that game like they wanted that game to be as less. They wanted that game to be as short as possible in terms of like if you watch, they weren't in a hurry to inbound the ball. Right. They played super deliberate. And I just feel like that's not the team. I get it. It's a bad environment. You're in Utah. You want to take the crowd Weird out of altitude. it. Bring, yeah, and you want to like take the air out of the ball and make the game. But is that really the team you want to force a half-court matchup against? No. Utah. I feel like they they play half-court. I mean, the Clippers are a super uh, efficient offensive team in the half-court. But I don't know. It just seemed like... It just seems like the, the Clippers, when I watch them play really well, when I'm, when they're playing really well, it's it's usually they're getting out and they're creating like these mismatches where they can get J, like JJ Redick is a great player and he's a great, he's struggling in this series, but I feel like he benefits a lot from their early to late off, like their early to mid transition offense. It's that Warriors chaos thing where it's it's those first six seconds after something when everybody's scrambling to go wherever, and that's when he's really good. That's where games are won usually. If you yeah. look at something, like it's in that this stretch that happens that just something goes mad for like two or three minutes. It happened in the, in the Wizards Atlanta game. They they Ubre got a steal, Jennings got a steal. They did this, they did that, and all of a sudden they're up twelve, and that happens. I feel like the Clippers are never in that situation where they're playing that style on the road where they're ever just going to be up twelve because they're they're going on a run. They're just not going to be going. Because Celtics on a run. are another team like that. They love the chaos. Yeah. They love when when it, when they start slowing it up and Isaiah's bringing up their sixteen seconds on the shot clock when he's just passing over yeah. half court. I'm always like that. The Bulls should be slowing that pace down and making it super choppy and awkward. The more chaotic it gets, the worse they should it is be for running them. post ups and back downs. With yeah, all the Lopez time. in the game getting the gla- getting getting the rebound or, or go they, old school eighties. Like like what David Blatt had the Cavaliers do versus Golden State in right. the 2015 exactly. finals. You, you want, want a 92-89 game. You want a caveman style of basketball yes. where just someone's backing. And Jimmy Butler can do that back down, start backing down from the three-point line. Then Wade it, can do it too. That's kind of his style now. That's all he does. Yeah. But it's, I mean, or, you know, the other thing is you could have Michael Carter-Williams in there <laughs> along with Joffrey <laughs> Laverne, and you could have him run pick and roll. <laughs> you could do that too. Michael Carter-Williams. I will say defensively, he does bug Isaiah a little bit. 
Yeah, of course. But <laughs> offensively, you're playing four and five, and it's it's. <laughs> I mean, literally, ridiculous. you might even be playing three and a half on five. We did a thing where we were studying like the shot angles and like the ability of a shot to go in in terms of like how like how how lucky or unlucky was a miss, because like just the arc of the ball could it have gone in or didn't it go in, and he had like. So many where the camera, the sport view camera tracking was messed up because he was hitting the backboard and the camera didn't know if it, if it was like over on this side of the court or that side. Like if you watch the ball, it would bounce all around the court because he's taking these threes that are hitting the top of the backboard, the side of the backboard. Yeah. The, the le- they go, when they go left or right, that's never a good sign. Yeah. Yeah. He so is the, the worst shooter in the league and it's not close. Yeah. Of, of anyone under like six, eight. It's, yeah, it's pretty, I don't, well, Roberson. How tall is he? Six nine. But Ro- Roberson at least had five weeks last spring. Yeah, Roberson's when better. he made shots. But, but Michael Carlum's can make free throws. Is, true. And so it's interesting, right? So I hate. I hate. I tweeted this yesterday. I hate Hack a Shack. I think it's awful. I, I love thought, it in its current incarnation. It, it was brilliant how they used it yesterday. Yeah. It was really, really savvy, smart. I always wonder, like. When it's just used as like an effective quickie strategy just to throw a team off, yeah. it's really effective. I don't understand why teams don't do it with the clips more. Yeah. Like just the just the random, oh, we fouled DeAndre and then don't do it again. It's like, are they gonna do this again? No, and then it's in your head. Yeah. I thought I thought I changed game four, I thought it was smart. Utah could definitely benefit from that at yeah. some point because the Clippers are so ridiculously efficient on offense. And you knock them out of the flow because I think there's certain teams, the Clips, the Warriors, I think the Celtics are like this, where they get in these six minute grooves. And all you have to do is that one hack of shack well, stops it. Think reset. about this. Think about this. If 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 DeAndre, you're gambling that he has a poor night from the line. If he does, <laughs> who do they go to? They have to take him out. Doc has to take him out. Who do they go to now? Maurice Bates. You want right. that guy playing the five? Right. Versus Favors or Gobert and pick and roll. I would definitely. And I would definitely do that at some point. It's just tough because you have to be in the penalty already or the bonus, whichever. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it. And then you can only do it from, you know, you can't, can't do it in the last two minutes of a quarter. So you, it, it has to be a spec. You don't want to foul to get into the penalty because that just puts you in a bad situation. Um, so, yeah. And he has to be on the court. By the way, if time. Rondo decides to play, which I do not think can be ruled out because that guy played with a dislocated elbow and right. played, he finished a game with a torn ACL. Like, that guy's going to play in this series. Anyone yeah. who thinks he's not playing is insane. If he's playing out there with some sort of splint and he's just going to be like, Rondo's going to run the offense, and this, I would do hack a Rondo. Yeah. If he's going to have something on his hand. It's his left hand, though, right? I thought it was his shooting hand. No, it's his right hand. Oh, it's yeah, his it's right his hand. Shooting oh, yeah. hand. He can't play then. Can't play the I'm not thumb. ruling out Rondo. I'm telling you, wow. he'll figure it out. He'll just play with a. He'll play with the broken with hand. A paw, like a giant. <laughs> he'll just turn his hand into a paw. <laughs> they'll, I think they'll do something. They'll, I don't know what you could do. He'll be the first guy to do it. Yeah, he'll cut it off. He'll That's be like, I'm not losing the series. Thumb, Take my thumb. It off. <laughs> <laughs> but if he does play, in, if they don't do hack Rondo, that's insane. If he does play, they'll probably hack him. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think he's gonna, he might yeah. play. I don't know. You might be right. Golden State, um, next. Next round, playing the winner of this Clips Utah series. I haven't heard a lot of people talking about this. I don't think it'll happen. Sixteen and zero is not inconceivable to me. It's not inconceivable. No, it's not inconceivable either. The thing is that when they turn, they're as good defensively as they are offensively, and people don't realize that. If well, you, nobody realizes Durant's good on defense. So it's like it's like never gets mentioned when people you, talk about the Durant package. That's like the one thing where you talk about okay, well, if a team wants to muck, you know, bring the variance of three point shots, you aren't getting like are Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum getting a lot of open threes in the series or threes at all? They're not because they're switching everything one to five. Uh, Golden State is, and they've got so much length and arms. They're like Milwaukee only if Milwaukee was veteran and smart. Right. On defense and knew every rotation. The one thing that does muck it up a little bit is, uh, you know, their their head coach might not be there. And so you have Mike Brown. I was going to say there's only one man who can stop Golden State. <laughs> no, and unfortunately, exactly. it's Mike I, Brown. I, I Mike Brown's a fine coach. <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe. I'm not sure. Mike but Brown's a fine coach? They're all fine coaches. Look, you don't get to be an NBA head coach without being a decent coach, I don't think. I've kind of come I don't to that know realization. who you are right now. <laughs> I've come to that realization. I don't. <laughs> Uh, Mike Brown had LeBron at his absolute apex in 09 and 2010. Mm -hmm. 
then they kind of struggled offensively in big moments, which is pretty much impossible. I don't want to hear about the supporting cast. LeBron was at the height of his okay. powers. Oh okay, yeah, you got it. He was thirty-five, eleven, and fifteen or something in the in the thirteen playoff games that year. I can't, it was some crazy thirty-five, twelve, and nine or something like that. Yeah, there's only um, so much a coach can do, though. I, know. I mean, like look at like we're talking about Doc Rivers, and now how you know, he's not doing a good job, but they want a title with him, so. It's it's a lot of it is just the guys around you and finding something that works and sticking I don't with think it. Doc's doing a bad job. I, I think his from what I've seen the last couple of years, the biggest mistake is that they never tried small ball with Blake at the five. Yeah, just the whole league was going that way and, and, and never staggering. He's done so many things that people have thought are horrible, like right. staggering minutes, playing all bench units. Uh, that was like, remember the days when you and I were going crazy that Scott Brooks would take Westbrook and Durant out at the same time? It still remains one of the most inexplicable. Dude, they ran they ever. ran like a five man bench unit in game one and game two, and it was a total like their starters were up like twenty four and twenty eight points in the first two games, something like that, and then they rolled out Brandon Jennings. Right. Kelly Oubre Jr., Boyan Bogdanovich. He doesn't get it. Thomas Sadoransky. <laughs> right. like, I can't remember who the other guy was. Just was... play Waller Beal. Just keep Waller Beal out there. But You're he good. also had Wall out there with, like, oh, it was, yeah, I don't know. It's tough, though, because they don't have anything. They don't have any depth. That Washington team doesn't really have any depth, so I don't. And then Wall's playing so fast, I don't think he can play th- more than 38 minutes a game. True. He's going to. He's actually one of the few guys in the history of me watching the NBA where I actually fear for their safety. Sometimes. Did you see that the the dunk that he had? Yeah, in, that the was led, the most the behind rid- the back lefty. Ridiculous, and the speed of it. Like yeah. it, that's the thing. It, 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 the speed was just so that was breathtaking. I Him, thought. Westbrook, and Derrick Rose are the three guys from this decade where you're just like, oh my god. Yeah. Giannis is as fast, Giannis. but it doesn't seem like he's no, as fast. It's, it's like an optical so, illusion, and the steps are so long that it's 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 slow. It looks like it's going slower than it actually is, whereas Wall looks like it's going. Faster than it actually. It just looks so fast. Does Giannis win an MVP in the next five years? Probably. Does he win an MVP before Anthony Davis? Yeah. I don't know. I would say that the chance of Anthony Davis going an entire year without being injured and it has to be considered skeptically. It's tough. Yeah. I, I, I hope he, I mean, you know, but it just seems like I don't know what they could do. What did your model think when they traded for Boogie Cousins and put him and Davis on the same team? Um, I think it overvalued the, it definitely thought they would be better than they were. Yeah. But it's just, it's just too tough. Like mid season, you don't get very much practice. Like right. the model doesn't know that there's no practice, right? It's a model. It's Especially like, February, March. Nobody's yeah. practicing. Nobody, nobody cares. Yeah. Those games are like, I, I wasn't really paying too much attention to the New Orleans Hornets to begin or the Pelicans to begin with. So I didn't really know, but I do think that it would have overvalued them for sure. They kind of turned it on for a stretch there, played really good for a couple games and they just started resting everyone because they were trying to tank for a draft pick. I don't really care who wins Milwaukee and uh, Toronto. I should care. I'm Canadian, but I'm kind of rooting for Milwaukee. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't care. Like, I don't have a betting interest in it or anything. Giannis versus LeBron would be just thrilling for me. Yeah. I just feel like if you're a basketball fan and you don't have any ties to either team in this series and you didn't bet on them. You want that for sure. You want to see Giannis play LeBron. I want to see the freak of the last generation and still the freak go against the future freak and He's, i just want to see them battling like superheroes agree be that, would be a, that would be a fun series to watch Giannis is just so his, awesome too how about his defense how about, how about the brown he covers how about like how about like his tweets where he's like oh my god try smoothie for a first time i love america <laughs> like, like how do you not love this guy it's amazing him and his brother selling like like watches and stuff like that on the street in Athens is like homeless based not homeless but like trying to earn a living for the right. I mean it's just he was homeless for a little while it's amazing to me amazing. we did that draft Jalen and I 2013 and he was the one guy we just couldn't figure out like you know the foreign guys you're just watching YouTube clips basically exactly we're watching YouTube clips of him and it looked like he was playing against ninth graders in some gym in the YMCA and Jalen's like how old are those guys and yeah. I'm like I don't know I don't even know if they're 18 yeah and Especially we just when saw, you're playing like in a league that's not like when you're playing in like the Greek league or you're playing here, you're playing there again. Like you said, like it's one thing. Like there's that Luca. I don't know what his last name is. Luca. Oh, Luca. Dunk, Luca D- yeah, Dunkage. that guy. That guy's playing in Real Madrid He's already. Seventeen. Yeah. He might be. He might be the guy. The guy. Yeah. He's a, a high school junior playing in on Real Madrid against like the best players in Europe. Yeah. So yeah. against that, you can. And but then he's only his stats aren't very good. But right. because you have to look at, okay, he's 17. 
But like you said, how do you measure that? That was the stuff? Rubio 2008 Olympics thing. He's like 17 or 18 playing in the uh, yeah. Olympics. Mm-hmm. But if Rubio had a jump shot, he would be top three point guard in the league, top four point guard. Nick should have traded for him. 100%. For Rose's experiment. But so we're watching those Giannis clips. Sorry. Yeah. And we thought the gym was small. <laughs> Because <laughs> the ground, you get the st- to step, and we're just looking at the gym going, is the gym, is that like a, a smaller gym? Do they have smart, we couldn't figure it out. And then it turns out, no, he's, he's just, just like, giant. he took these giant steps. And then after they drafted him, he grew two inches. In this rookie year, he grew like two or three inches or something. Like that. There's a little bit of a revisionist history now with that draft. It's interesting. Like the Celtic fans get salty. I, I've made jokes about it. Like, oh, we took Olenek over Giannis. Yeah. But doing that draft we were all surprised Schroeder didn't go ahead of him. Like mm. Schroeder was like, was Schroeder, the Gobert, Giannis, there were all these different foreign guys. And Schroeder was the guy that we were like, oh, we could see him going 13, 14, 15. But see those, I don't know. I just feel like if you have a philosophy on drafting, like look at all of the really shocking draft picks in the history of like the last 10, 15 years. There haven't been like six foot three point guards or six foot two point guards. None of those guys shock you. It's the guys like Giannis, Jokic, uh, Gobert, like I, I feel like the teams that get it take Marcus gambles. Saw. Yeah, take gambles on big players because that's your biggest upside. And those are the players that take the lo- DeAndre Jordan. Those are the players that take the longest to develop. And for every case like that, you have another case of like a guy like Larry Sanders who was good but then didn't have his head on right. Or you have guys like I can't really think of any, but got big guys who just never. Ashamed the, to beat. Yeah, you have Ashamed to beat, right? But he was a number two. Like I'm talking about taking like in the late rounds. Flyers. Yeah, just you taking a flyer exactly. You it's can, funny though. I've asked people about Jokic because, like, the Celtics had throwaway picks that they could have taken Jokic, and everybody who scouted him that year was just like, "There was no way to see this coming." He was just this fat, pudgy kid who didn't seem like he cared that much about basketball. How yeah. do you know? Nurkic is another example because he, as a player playing last year or this year, excuse me, he looked like he didn't couldn't play either when he was playing for... And every team had scouting meetings like, all right, let's talk about Nurkic. He's yeah. available. Should we go get him? And then Portland gets him and he just goes off. Portland gave up... Portland got a first-round pick and Nurkic. Yeah. That's how low his value was. Yeah. And yeah. Who, who... I mean, I certainly didn't predict that that type of... I mean, he just made that offense roll. I think the one thing we've learned over the years with trades that, that end up being steals is... You really have to look at if the guy is just in the wrong situation. Yeah, of course. And it's and it's something we just don't do enough. You know, Nurkic and Jokic could not play together. They picked Jokic. Now you have this guy who's available at this declining price. That's a pretty good gamble. I didn't want the Celtics to trade for Nurkic. I was like, that guy's he can't. But I just was just judging from what I saw. Yeah. But um, but I, I think we've seen that over and over again. There's yeah. certain guys. State of mind of the player at the time, attitude, work ethic, that stuff that you can't really get from on court. And you Here's the flip side. Questions. I really like the Cameron Payne trade the Bulls made because Gibson's leaving anyway. I'm like, Cameron Payne, that's a classic bad situation guy. He's on Westbrook's team. He never has the ball. And then he goes to the Bulls and he stinks. Okay. Well, so that, that's think, the though? flip side of it. I don't know. He might. Is He's, he better than Isaiah Cannon? Isaiah Cannon and Michael Carter-Williams are playing over him and, in a playoff series. But does that mean that he's worse, or does it mean that the coach doesn't think he's good enough? Good point. You know, we don't know. Don't we'll, know. we'll know after game five, because I'm sure he's <laughs> going to play 38 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. So do you think the Warriors can go 16-0 and or no? The Houston variance probably screws it up, one of those games. That and the coaching and the, 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 just the, the, the – I mean, if they play Cleveland, I, Cleveland's going to take a game probably from them too. I, I don't think they go – I mean, I think they have a chance – they have a better chance than any other team to go 16-0 you know, that I can remember. South and the Lakers went 15-1 and that one year when they lost to Yeah, the 0-1 overtime. Lakers came freaking close. Yeah. OT game one finals. And they was didn't the just only win. They won happen. every game by a lot. That team was – that was like my, one of my greatest moments in – Robert well, that Bob was history. like you, you built your empire on that The year one. before, but the next year. And the next year. The next year I was riding that. I mean, they were so good. Derek Fisher got injured, came back from injury. They just went on a run. I was like, they, I remember they played the Spurs, and they were the underdog versus the Spurs that year, and they beat the Spurs like by 20 and 20 or something. Like that. I mean, they just crushed them. Yeah. It wasn't even close. That's your fa- 04 Pistons you did well, too. Uh, 04 Pistons, I did well, yes. But I 08 did, Celtics? 04 Pistons, I pivoted. Oh, poor Pistons, I thought they're not going to have a chance after watching game one. I was like, this team gets every loose ball. Yeah. They're, they're not, they're drawing fouls because they're more athletic. They're, Carl Malone got injured. I was like, this is just, this is a bad. Oh, eight Celtics, I did bad. I, I had the Celtics, I had the Lakers that year. Oh my God. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, that's, that's the worst that's thing I've ever heard. I became really bitter and looked back at all these Phil Jackson quotes. I was like, how is this happening? Why are they letting out so many open corner threes? What is going on here? Um, I did bad that year. I've had a bunch where I've done bad. The playoffs are tough. When I was, it was, it's tough. The playoffs are very tough. There's so many things you can't predict. The best team doesn't always win in a seven game series. It's tough. I don't, I don't really, I don't really do the series. I don't, when I was, you know, I never really did series plays. I'd always just bet the individual games for the most part. So. Sal and I made our big bet before the year, which was that Golden State would not win the title because we like the odds. It's just a death ship. It's just a, it's a everyone on the ship is dead. It's just sailing across the ocean <laughs> yeah. into the middle of nowhere. It has no chance. We, we'd have to have an injury at this point. Yeah. Could happen though. The I mean, theory was. You have Durant. I mean, who knows? New team did, throwing new guys together. The history of it says it takes a year to figure out. Do we know how healthy Durant is though? I mean, he could no. play probably, but who knows what happens when he plays? This is a good point, And this is where we'll end. Um, because I think we've seen this with Kevin Love, too. These guys come back from injuries, and we're like, they're back. They're fine. And it's like a lot of times they're not fine. Yeah. And a lot of times it takes three, four weeks for them to kind of look like themselves again. I think we saw that with Kevin Love. I think he came back from a knee injury, and he just wasn't the same for a while. Now it's starting. Now he's starting to bang bodies and starting to look like Kevin Love again. But <coughs> I still wonder. I don't understand the Darren Williams thing. I just don't understand it. The guy, the guy arguably looks as good as he's looked in like five years. This is somebody I thought was on his way out of the league. He had some games for Dallas that played, where he played really he well. Did. If you watched him. I just think he doesn't have to do a lot. He doesn't have to start. And in little bursts like that, like his thing is a durability, like being able to play for an entire game. I right. Think he's perfect for it's 19 perfect. minutes. It's, yeah, it's perfect. That was a really, I thought that was a waste of time to sign that guy. I was completely wrong. No, I thought that he would do okay for them. Yeah. I watched, I watched him play a little bit this year and I was like, hey, he's probably not going to play 30 minutes a game, but he can play in stretches. They have, first of all, one of the most fun playoff teams we've ever had. They can come back from any lead. They can blow any lead. Oh, yeah. You can never turn the Cavs off. And then you get J.R. Smith too. Yeah, you get, uh, I mean, you get one of the three best players ever and Kyrie who can put up 50 in any playoff game, even though he never does, but it's always looming. Yeah. And Kevin Love can always be weird and, but they, they could be down 26. You're like, I'm not turning it off. They but, could score 140 points in a game this year, in a regulation game in the playoffs. Yeah, could we could, they, but it, what'll be interesting in the, in the finals, if it's Cavs Warriors, do they want to do no. the, the – see, they won't. They're going to yeah. slow it down no, and go the other be, way. It would have to be – it would have had to have been versus Indiana, I think, probably, because they're not going to do it against Milwaukee or Toronto. So that's, you don't think they're going to do it against the Celts or that Washington? Game, a, a team where they – I mean, if they played the Celtics, it could be what, that type of game. I think it could be for Washington, too, because Washington's going to turn on the Jets and go and – Yeah, I'm not sure. It's always tough to, to know what the teams will do and this, what, what their strategy is. But, yeah, they're just all right. so all good offensively. Austin Rivers is back for game. Uh, here we go. All right. Uh, that voted, changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> it actually does help them. I voted for him for second team all defense. He's a good, I mean, he's, thank you. He, he fouls, he's a good defensive player, but it's, he's a good defensive player because he fouls all the time. He's, and he, he, he learned from Chris it. Paul, the master. Chris Paul commits 20 fouls a game. Yeah, no, he is. He's, he's, look, he gets a lot of flack. He's not as bad as people think he is, and he's not as good as he thinks he is, which is probably true of every person in this world. <laughs> no no right. one's as good as they think they are <laughs> at anything, but you know, no, he's not as bad as people think he is. He's, 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 he'll, he'll help them. Thanks again to Proper Cloth. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to them. Proper Cloth custom shirts start for from $85. High-quality shirts made from premium Italian and Japanese fabrics. They guarantee a perfect fit. Remakes are free. Their team makes it super easy to do. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Start looking your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS to save $20 on your first shirt. Don't forget about the Ringer NFL show and the Ringer NBA show, those podcasts. whole bunch of stuff going on this week, theringer.com. I will have a column there, maybe even two this week. And Haral Bob, you can follow on Twitter. You've been I've been, you've been more laid back this year. You've Just been taking it easy. easy. Yeah. I, I still got into it in the playoffs a little bit, but I didn't do anything during the regular season. Just H-A-R-A-L-A-B-O-B at... Um, no, there will be a game when you snap. It's gonna come. <laughs> it, it, it's just your history. I'm going. I'm going by your usage rate, your history, your PR throughout the playoffs. You're gonna have a. You're gonna have a 25 tweet binge coming. I, think I just don't know that. when. I know I've already had that. But who was it about? I mean, the last two games I was watching. I had nothing else to do, so I was watching the games and tweeting. 
But afterwards, it's like you always feel like regret. It's like a bad one night stand. You know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Why me on Twitter is like a bad one night stand. Yeah, I probably shouldn't be allowed on Twitter during Celtic games, especially in the playoffs, because <laughs> I I just know too much about my team and and I take everything too personally. But you know, I was calling for Gerald Green in game one. I was sitting next to my dad. I'm like, we're gonna have to play Gerald Green. Oh, he's they need well. one more guy on the perimeter who can at least make uh make Chicago. At least think twice. They mm-hmm. just didn't have it. So now they spread it out. They did, they did basically what they did in Utah against Gobert. They spread it out, bring the big guy out, mm-hmm. make him try to guard somebody. It worked. I'll be interested to see with uh, Rondo with this one hand whether it works. Corral Bob Bulgaris. It was a pleasure. I'm glad yeah. we did this. Thanks it's been a me. long time. For sure. Thank All you. right.